Game week 10 then, and another blank for Haaland. That's just one return in five, absolutely incredible. Um, two one defeat for City at Bournemouth. Haaland had five shots, two big chances. Really frustrating again. Just snatching at them, aren't they? And, and, and it's just not running for him. I mean, it will change, but then how long do we hold him? I mean, the tactic is in many circles now, get rid of Haaland for game week 12, move to Palmer, start bringing in Arsenal assets again. And it's hard to build a case not to do that. It's Brighton next for Haaland. I think that is a good fixture for him. And I think we hold for that if you still have him. And then look at game, game week 12, as we say. Spurs at home, though, is a good fixture. So I think there's much to debate when we get there. But as for this game week, yeah, he frustrated again. As I said, it was the five shots, a 0.90 um, XGI from the game. So a strong output in terms of data. Foden came out even better, four shots and one chance created, 1.04, was the most in the game week so far after Saturday's games. But he again frustrated, I got rid, and I don't really regret that, particularly with De Bruyne back on the bench now for City. That, that would indicate to me that you know, Pep's going to try and get De Bruyne back in that team for obvious reasons, to get things ticking again. And what does that mean for Foden with, with Savio around, with Doku around, Savio surprisingly fit and back on the bench in this game after being carried off in midweek. So Foden, for me, although he stood out here, is a concern going forward now that De Bruyne is fit. Elsewhere for City, Vardial got his third goal of the season, which is you know, obviously ridiculous output for a defender so far. He started and Lewis didn't. Now, as a Lewis owner, that is a little bit of a concern, particularly after what Pep said of the week about him. He couldn't rest him. He's the one player he couldn't rest him. What does he do? Benches him for Bournemouth. So predictable. And Pep does like having fun with us, doesn't he? I'm not worried as a Lewis owner. He's a player that I, I don't rely on as my defensive free, but I want to bring in with fixture. And I think he will get back in the team after that rest. As for Vardy Old, two clean sheets for City. Although the goal output is impressive, I don't, I don't really want to spend that amount on a player in a defence who, who still can see goals. Um, so for me, Vardy Old's a no-go unless we're going to change our tactics and start spending big in defence. And that's not the way it's going. It's all going into midfield, which is why we're looking to get rid of Haaland. As for Bournemouth, I mean, they have the, one of the key players when it comes to saving money, and that is Semenyo. 5-6, he was impressive again here. Seven shots involvements. I think that was four shots, three chances created in the game. Um, what was it? 0.71 is XGI from, the, from this game week. Right up there, I think he will be by the end of the game week. If you got rid, then I think you're going to want him back because on the ticker, Bournemouth are second only to Wolves. Uh, over the next 11-12 game weeks. So the fixtures are good for, for Semenyo and Bournemouth. And he is clearly the standout, despite Evan Nilsson getting his third goal of the season and Kirk has two assists. For Bournemouth, it's Semenyo the key asset. But Arsenal also slipped up, of course. 1-0 defeat at Newcastle. And this was a really disappointing performance by Arsenal. 1.05 the XG created in the game. And Saka came out of it with just two shots and one chance created. 0.45 XGI. Havertz just one shot. It's not enough, is it? Um, and we're starting to see them stutter with the injuries and dents in confidence. Gabriel did come back into the team to help their defence. But it's now just, uh, what is it, five about a clean sheet now for Arsenal. They've moved down to the fourth-ranked defence in the league. They're the seventh-ranked attack in the league when looking at XG data. So suddenly they're just they're not registering elite numbers. And, and assets like Saka and Havertz aren't the kind of go-tos that they were before. I mean, the fixtures have been tougher for them. And certainly from game week 13 onwards, that's when we're really starting to get interested in Arsenal once again. And I think I will be moving to at least one of Saka or Havertz. But I'm probably not going to load up on that Arsenal defence until I see a bit more solidity. I think it's a fullback they got the problem. A lot of rotation, a lot of injuries there, a lot of unsettled situations in that defence, which has, has meant that Raya and Saliba and Gabriel have really dropped off in terms of output. As for Newcastle, it was Isaac and Gordon who combined for the goal. No surprise, they're their two key players. But 0.53 XGI or XG in the game for Newcastle suggests that they, they haven't found the fluidity yet. 
Uh, and they go to Forest, they go to City Ground next, and that's not going to be an easy game for Newcastle. So I don't think that we're in any hurry to look at Newcastle, but they could yet be some use to us over the season, that's for sure. Liverpool do what Liverpool have been doing all season, grinding out the result. 1-0 down to a Brighton side that looked, they had, looked like they had the better of them in that first half, which they did. But Slot did the magic again at half-time. Didn't tweak tactically, but just got more out of his team. And they turned it round to win the game 2-1. Salah, of course, with the crucial win. A lot of, a lot of managers moved off Haaland to captain Salah and it worked out. I captain Salah and it worked out. And he came out of the game with five shot involvements. It was two chances created, three shots for 0-4 and 6-5. XGI. I guess the big news here though was the team news from Slot. He rested Diaz to the bench again, started Gakpo, rested Robertson who looks now like he might have lost his place at left back to Simicast. And Simicast came out with three chances created, one shot as well, 0.56 XGI, which significantly surpassed Trent Alexander-Arnold who only created two chances for 0.10. So if Simicast has got that left back spot now at 4.6, that's an obvious downgrade if you want to move money off Trent, and it's becoming harder and harder by the game week to justify holding on to Trent. Liverpool defence is still top ranked. It's still one we've got to consider, um, despite conceding here. But they lost Canate to an arm injury, and it was interesting that Gomez at 4-8 was the player to come off the bench, not Kwanzaa to replace him. So there could be another budget option there. And I guess you've got to ask, with, with Simakas and Gomez perhaps in that starting Liverpool defence now, are they going to be as secure They've done okay with, with Alisson out and he'll be back soon, we would have thought, after the international break. So that might signal another increase in solidity at the back for Liverpool with Alisson there, although Keller has been good. So they remain a, a defence and a team that we've got to look at, but it's in attack where it's all about. And I think with Jota out injured and now Diaz <laughs> benched again, it is boiling down to, you've got to have Salah, haven't you? And I think with the fixtures that Liverpool have got and the form that he's shown, nine points here, almost a seventh double-digit return, his consistency is extraordinary. And as we move away from Haaland, it's just becoming obvious that Salah's got to be a target. As for Brighton, the one player that stood out for me, and I mentioned in Black Box in the week, Caddy Oglu, who played right midfield rather than right, right fullback, and got his goal. Uh, two shots and one chance created 0 0.30 XGI. With Brighton's fixtures really perking up very, very soon as part of that swing from game week 12, I think Caddy Oglu, as a defender, has got to be worth a look. So I was at the city ground to witness the latest uh, victory for Forest. Three in a row now, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, three nil over West Ham. It was very, very routine. And Chris Wood with an eight for the season. He is an absolute machine. Just can't be stopped. Uh, two shots, 0.79 XG I in the game. Um, I mean, cleared one off the line as well. Declared man the match. I'm not sure he was. There was a lot of good players on show for Forest, but Wood. It's hard, as I said, to make a case against him because Forrester getting in the service, it was Moreno who provided the assist uh, in this game. Moreno had his best attacking game for Forrest, but Aina also came out with a goal, the other fullback, And then Milenkovic was so unfortunate. He had one just wide, one header just wide, another effort palmed over by Fabianski with a great save. It's only a matter of time before Milenkovic gets that attack in return. So, so much potential in this Forrest side. I haven't even talked about hudson Adoy, who came out with eight shot involvements, four shots, four chances created, got the goal, of course. So there's just value in that Forest team everywhere. The thing is, the fixtures do stiffen up. It's Newcastle, then it's switch, but then it does get tougher for Forest. But they're a team that are just not going to be a pushover for anyone. And I think they're going to keep clean sheets when you don't expect them to, as we saw at Anfield. So I, I can't really back against going with one of the defence and Chris Wood at the moment. Although there are many, many options up top, eight goals for the season and the service just keeps coming. And the confidence in that forest side is just on such a new level. Uh, and it was so obvious that there was a golfing ability, I think, in what we saw in that game against West Ham, but a golfing, also the confidence level, the spirit in the team. West Ham looks shot, absolutely shot. I'd be very surprised if Lopetegui can hold on to that job. And if you've got Bowen, yeah, I mean, I'll... I admire you for the differential, but that West Ham team just aren't playing well. There's no confidence, no spirit there. 
and I think they're going to struggle while Lopetegui, I just can't see him finding the solution. So for me, West Ham remain a no-go, Forest the opposite. <laughs> It's which one, Leicester one, pretty predictable outcome from this game. And I guess it was only a matter of time before Leif Davis rewarded his owners as well. If you didn't bench him like as, I had to enjoy that. So Leif Davis with the goal, came out with three chances created and the one shot, 0.31 XGI. He is a great asset in a promoted side, but it's a promoted side that is going to concede goals, not keep clean sheets, and they're not going to score too many either. So it's very similar to what we saw with Doughty last season. Although I do think... The Leeds Davies is a step up. It's tough fixtures to come now, though. Spurs, United, and then Forest for its switch. So if you're holding Davies, you're probably going to bench him over those games anyway. As for Leicester, uh, Buona Notte to stand out. I think he's outstanding. Another six shot involvements, three chances created, three shots. And the fixtures do turn from game weeks 14 onwards for Leicester. And I, th I think like, it's a bit like Leif Davies. He's never going to be an asset that we can rely on and play every week. But when fixtures are good, I think he's a player we've got to look at, and that run for Leicester is tempting, and he is absolutely outstanding for me. So, Anton won Everton nil, a game of little consequence, really, in FBL terms, apart from more agony for Calvert Lewin owners. I, I shouldn't tease them, but it's now. Six successive blanks with a start. He only played an hour here before ironically being replaced by Beto, who had, who had Everton's best chances and perhaps should have got them at least an equaliser. Um, Beto came on and topped the XGI in this game as well. Calvert-Lewin only had one shot. He's had, I think, 16 shots over the six last six starts without a goal. Um, and yeah, he was, would, he, would he hold his place? I guess they keep faith in him, but I don't know. I, I think if you're holding Calvert-Lewin... You're this long. This was the fixture that you were going to hold him for, but then you've got to get rid. And I just think there's too many options now. Uh, as for McNeil, he came back and I didn't expect him to. And it is West Ham and Brentford next. They are two defences that are going to give up chances. So if you're holding McNeil, I think you can, you can stay patient. And less so, I think, with Calvert-Lewin, given the confidence and given the profile for Beto, which is rising all the time. Uh, as for Southampton, not too much to talk about from a fancy perspective. If you had Harwood Bellis and started him, well done. First clean sheet for Southampton. Uh, and as for Dibbling owners, they saw their player benched. And so he's perhaps becoming a fringe player again and not that 4-5 or five budget option that we hoped he would be. Entertaining draw at Molyneux, two all. Um, a lot of investment in this game in Ain't Nori and Kuna, and I, I think it's warranted. We say that you know the fixture ticker is just overwhelmingly positive for O'Neill's side, and I think those two assets showed enough in this game to think that we'll get returns from them. Kuna came out of an assist, but again he was he's their one key player. Strand Larson got the goal set up by Kuna, but he also set up three other chances. Came out of it at 0.32. XGI, but he's by far their key player, and I think he will be profitable for FPL managers over this run. As for Aitnori, Norway, I think he had a couple of shots, no chances created. You're not going to get clean sheets in Monroe, I don't think. That will be a rarity, so you are relying on attacking returns, a bit like Leif Davis. But I do see, think it's warranted, given his price, 4-6, and given the fixtures that Wolves have got. But Kuna, for me, is the big standout. As for Palace, they're really a no-go in fancy terms, particularly why Eze is out. So not really anything to talk about of note here. Maybe when Eze is back, we'll we start seeing some appeal. But right now, the interest is all about Wolves in this game, and it's justified. So that's it for Saturday's games. Uh, not going badly for me this week, so I had the Salah captaincy. And also I started Semenyo and Bench Lewis. Nothing shady there before we say it. I just thought the Bournemouth would score, and obviously that would mean start Semenyo and Bench Lewis. Um, worked out for me, Semenyo with the goal. And uh, like I said, a player I'm going to hold on to now. I've got five players, no, six players left to go, including four 
in the Spurs Villa game. So I've got Poro, Johnson, Rogers, and Solanke. Big game for Solanke if he if he really doesn't show up in this game. And I mean, just a couple of shots would be nice, wouldn't it? Then I think that he's going to be a big sell very, very soon. I'll probably hold him for the Ipswich game, but after that, he's going to be gone, unless we say something spectacular here. Big game, I think, for Villa as well. I mean, Watkins, that you know, I think he needs a, a return in this game to hold off, to stave off that move towards the cheaper strikers like Kuna, who we've discussed. And Rogers, you know, he's one of several midfielders that may make way in teams. I've talked about those who got rid of Semenyo. I've got Johnson, Semenyo, Himbumo and Rogers. One of those has got to go because obviously Salah's not going to go when I move to Palmer. And right now I am thinking it could be Rogers. So how he performs and what he produces in this game could be key to whether that changes my mind. Well, I asked for the spectacular from Solanke and I got it. A 16-point return, his biggest of the season. Five shots, all in the box. 1.52 XGI, the top in the game week so far with one game to go. We got what we wanted from him. Um, I think the difference was that he was spending much more time in central areas further forward and they were getting crosses in. That's the big thing. I mean, it, as it turned out, Johnson's goal... Johnson got a goal from his only shot in the game. He took that off the toe of Solanke. It could have easily been a hat-trick. He had a half chance in the first half as well. So much better from Dominic Solanke, just when we needed it as well. Obviously a, a massive return for my team. More on that in a bit. Johnson also came in, only had that one shot, as I say, 0.63 is XGI from that effort. But it's seven goals in 11 games now for Johnson. No question that he is a threat and he's... And he's getting more minutes. There is just no one off the bench who can replace him. He was absolutely shattered at the end, but, but Ange isn't really subbing him early anymore. Um, so that's a key thing. He's on the pitch at the death. Um, unlike Son, who only had two chances created in the game, very quiet overall. Obviously created that goal, got the assist for Johnson. Um, but, yeah, really didn't have a major impact. Was very miffed to go off on the hour mark. Was a bit of a surprise because it was one all at the time. But in the end, Richardson came on and set up that goal. Got an assist himself, so uh, for Solanke's second. So yeah, overall, a, a great attacking performance by Spurs. And they're the only team now who are averaging over two XGI non-penalty per 90. They are the top attacking side. And they take that record into its, which at home next, who have an XGC non-penalty per 90 of 2.15. So it's the best attack versus the best defence when it comes to XG and XG conceded coming next. And as a manager who holds Poro, Johnson and Solanke, that's got to be encouraging. Do you, do you hold Solanke for that? Of course you do. And maybe after as well. They go to Man City in game week 12. That'll be the crunch fixture because I won't know whether I need to get rid of Johnson or Solanke. What I do with Spurs. But their fixtures after that aren't too bad. And I actually think, you know, we've seen Spurs go to the Etihad and cause them problems and we're seeing a lot of teams this season caused City problems. So I'm not against taking my Spurs players into that. And perhaps if you have to hold Solanke for the trip to the Etihad, if it's off another return against Ipswich, that might not be a bad thing. As for Villa in this game, Rogers gave me plenty of food for thought as well. I'll talk about whether it was him I was going to get rid of. He got the goal. Obviously, he couldn't miss it from the corner. It was a bad mistake at the set piece again by Spurs, who really struggle with those, don't they? Um, but yeah, he did his piece. I mean, he, he had four shots, uh, no, four shot involvements, two chances created, two shots. Watkins, in contrast, was very, very quiet. Just two shots, 0.46. Three touches in the box. Just one goal in four now for Watkins. And that's a concern. He got a price drop overnight, so people are moving him out. And I can't say I blame them, really, because those cheaper options, as I said, are very, very tempting. And it's Liverpool away next before the fixtures pick up with Palace, Brentford and Southampton, the next three at Villa Park. So maybe a hole, but I can see why people needing to flush the cash out are getting rid of Watkins. 1-1 one, one at Old Trafford and that last a goal will turn for Bruno from the spot. Um, I mean, basically, it's been due. He's had five shots in each of his last two games. He had eight shot involvements in this game. Four chances created, four shots. The penalty was, in the end, the decisive action. But yeah, the data has been pointing to this and pointing to a resurgence in Bruno. Could he become... An elite asset again under Amarim? I don't know. I mean, the fixtures are certainly there, there's no doubt. Leicester, it's which Everton, the next three for United. But I do look at their attack and think, Rashford, Garnacho, Hoyland, are these ruthless takers of chances that 
Bruno's going to get assists from. That's the that's the key issue. United, I think it's nine goals all season. Only Southampton, I think, have scored less. So, are we going to see an overnight resurgence of that United attack? I think it's a big ask. But obviously, if you've got to make up ground with those fixtures, Bruno could be an option. The issue for me is just the midfield places. I've spoken about what am I going to do to make room for Palmer. And yeah, finding a place for Bruno as well, I, do, I just don't see it. And for me, that, it's a little bit optimistic on the impact of the new manager. But as for Chelsea, I mean, Palmer had a fairly quiet game. Still sneaked in for one bonus points low. Six shot involvements on the day. Three shots, three chances created, 0.71 XGI. I don't think he had his best game. Less impactful than I would want. And it's interesting as well. He, he started out on the left-hand side again rather than the right. And I think he's coupled with Rhys James because when Rhys James switched in the second half and Cucurella came on, we saw Palmer go with James as well back to the right-hand side. So I think there's something going on there with Maraska, tying up Rhys James with, with Palmer because on the other side, he inverts the fullback, which obviously uses up the spaces that Palmer would be in on that flank. So I think that's a thing to watch for. I think it's debatable yet whether that's impacting Palmer's output. But there's no question for game week 12 with the fixtures Chelsea has got. He's got to be a target. I don't, I don't think I'm going to change my plan there. He's coming in in game week 12 and I'm going to have to sell Haaland to make way for that move. Elsewhere for Chelsea, not too much to talk about other than Jackson picking up his fourth yellow card this season. He had one chance created. That's already a disappointing game for him. And that fourth yellow makes him a risk now, among other players. We talked about Semenyo yesterday, forgot to mention. He's on four bookings as well, along with eight Norway. So we've got to watch that now. We're getting close to those first suspensions. And they should be factors in our thinking when it comes to transfers. Well, that was a crazy game. Um, as a Flecken owner, it was absolutely heartbreaking. I knew it would happen. I absolutely knew it. He was sitting on 12 points, got 10 saves. And I was, I was chatting to Az on WhatsApp. Going and as Met said to me, when do you think he'll break your heart? And I said, when he gets maximum bonus, then he'll, then he'll shit the bed. <laughs> and he did exactly that in spectacular style. Brentford completely blowing it, conceding two late goals. Flecken going from 12 points to four. It would have been an amazing haul for a keeper that hasn't kept a clean sheet all season against a team who've scored in every game. It was inevitable. I knew it would happen and it did. Um, and um, so to be honest, I dealt with it okay. And, and to be honest, I had a good game week, more on that in a minute. But from the game, very low impact on fantasy, really. Uh, Wilson Brace, Robinson got an assist. He was probably the only asset to come out with points in the game that had impact on FBL. Uh, Jimenez went off after 70 minutes, had two shots, 0.09 XGI, so really low XGI in the game. Back-to-back -back blanks for Jimenez now. Don't think it's a major concern. And they've got Crystal Palace and Wolves next. So the fixtures are still good for Jimenez owners. And although Munez is there, I think it will take another couple of blanks. Then you've got to start to worry. So there is concern, particularly if he doesn't get a goal in the next two. Um, elsewhere, Mbumo is completely anonymous for Brentford. As an attacking force, they were, they were just not at the races at all. They got the early goal and then they just sat on it and I guess they got what they deserved in a way because they didn't show too much ambition. Um, but yeah, so very little in the game um, for, for FBL managers in the end. Uh, I came out of it with four points of Fleck and I'll take that and three from Brumo. I'll definitely take that. Brentford have got Bournemouth, Everton and Leicester next. No clean sheets for, for Fleck and there, but I'll certainly take the four points. It's just a heartbreak in having had the 12. But 75 points for the game week for me, which is which is crazy. Um, just what I needed, up to 1.4 million, a rank gain of 1.9 million, which is exactly what I said in Black Box last week. I said that although I was having a bad season for rank, I always felt this season there were big point swings in it because of the way that the variety of teams uh, and the variation in the heavy hitters. And um, yeah, just by playing Semenyo and Captain in Salah, and obviously Johnson came in as well, as did Rogers. I had this massive rank climb. So I'm, I feel much better about my rank now uh, and ongoing, continue to enjoy this season. So let's see how it goes from here. Um, hope you had a good game week. Just a bit of injury news that came in today. Uh, Canate is fit, looks like he's going to be okay. So no danger there if you own Canate and, and no appeal for Gomez if you were thinking of going that way. Elsewhere, Palmer apparently picked up a knee injury from that... From that uh, Tackle by Martinez, I'm, I, that didn't look serious to me, but there's, there's lots of stories going around about that. 
Uh, and also Harlan picked up a training injury. There was something on Sky today which was pretty laughable. I don't believe a word of that. And obviously they've got the European game coming up. So we'll get clarity on that. Um, we'll round all that up on Black Box. We'll be back uh, on Thursday, I think it'll be. So me and Az will be talking then. Uh, I'm, I've closed the gap on him. Feel a lot better. Feel more optimistic. Hope you do too. Crazy game week. Lots more to come. Hope you like this. Hit the subscribe button if you're new. And if you did like the video, hit like and I'll see you next time.